I don't want to say it was just stupidity, but it kind of was. It was just really insane assumptions of what happens when you give out massive tax cuts. That was just so interesting historically that it was the market that punished what you might call a neoliberal policy. The free marketeers have very silly, <laughs> often assumptions and theory that is not based on an understanding of the market. If people just say, we need growth, we need productivity increase, oh, we're gonna spend a lot of money in R&D. Really? Okay, who doesn't want that? That's not enough to talk about growth. The question is, what do we know that actually causes growth? But that's the smart economics that we should be having to show you're fiscally responsible. It's not the dumb economics by saying, oh yeah, we're gonna do green, but not too much money. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll help people. Oh, but we can't afford school meals. It's like, what have you learned? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Mariana Mazzucato. Welcome back to Politics Joe. How are Thank you? Thank you. Very happy to be here. I'm good. Very hot. glad to have Very you here. Hot. It is. It's roasting out there. Thankfully, the aircon's on, so we'll, we'll hang tough. Um, you last came in six months ago. How have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, I've been working nonstop with amazing governments. Yeah? The best. You the, want to hear about the best one? The Prime Minister Mia Mali. Yes. Uh, Barbados. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So working very closely with her. Just came back from Brazil. Uh, working with Lula mm -hmm. on his ecological transition plan and trying to make sure that the government does it in an aligned way with all the departments as opposed to what often happens is that every department has its own mm -hmm. sustainability agenda. Uh, also with Colombia, but I also was just on holiday. Perfect. Yeah. Whereabouts? Sicily. Love it. Ginosta, a little island off of Sicily. Great. Um, for those who haven't seen our last conversation, um, I'd like to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself, tell people who you are and what you do. Sure. So I'm Mariana Mazzucato. I sound Italian because I am. <laughs> uh, and then when I was five, moved to the US, but I've been in this country, in the United Kingdom, for 22 years. All my kids were born in London. Uh, they sound like Londoners, so they say, la. <laughs> 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 anyway, and I've set up this uh, institute at University College London, which is called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, because my work over the last 30 years, yes, I'm getting old, is all about purpose. How do we actually bring goals, objectives, outcomes to the center of economic theory and economic policy? Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Because uh, most economic theory is quite limited in how it thinks about value. So this idea that value is created in the private sector and at best can be facilitated, enabled, fixed, you know, fixing market failures from the public sector is part of the reason we end up getting rubbish policy, um, which is always kind of too little, too late, mm -hmm. reactive instead of proactive. And so these problematic policies are nested within problematic economic theory. So what the Institute does, it has three different pillars, rethinking political economy, so research, we have bright young PhD students uh, joining us, uh, rethinking the education of economics, uh, both in general, but also for civil servants, rethinking what value is, what is purpose orientation, why do we need bureaucracies that are creative and not kind of inertial. Um, so kind of really rethinking organizational capability, but from a new type of economics. And then the third pillar is working with policymakers in a respectful way. In other words, we don't just write papers and at the end it says, here, policymakers, listen to how smart we are, here's what you should do. We work with them from the beginning and mm. kind of do what we call practice-based theorizing. So new theory, for example, about public banks and development banks. We think about it, we work with those people working in them, and then we bring back the lessons back to the theory. Mm -hmm. um, but I also write books, so I guess the book we're talking about today, I wrote 10 years ago, The Entrepreneurial State, but since then I also wrote The Value of Everything, Rethinking Value. Um, mission economy, what does it actually mean to learn from the Apollo program in terms of you know, actually getting public and private sectors to work well together on a really ambitious plan and to write contracts that are fair instead of parasitic. And recently the big con, which we spoke about some months ago on how, again, a lot of the problems we're facing is due to this massive outsourcing of the brains of government to others. Mm -hmm. And you know, government is to blame for that. It's not just McKinsey, but that kind of McKinseyfication, or if you want, you can replace the I with the U, of, <laughs> of our economies. <clears throat> Ooh. Uh, that's a result of also that problem I mentioned before, mm -hmm. wrong economic theory. I think you mentioned as well uh, in our last conversation, uh, we were talking of Dominic, you meeting Dominic Cummings and saying, I loved your book. And you, mm. uh, well, there's a difference between reading and understanding the subject yeah. matter here. <clears throat> and hopefully this conversation will help people to understand some of the themes that we're talking yeah. about. If we've got time, I'd love to talk <coughs> about um, mission, mission based sort of government and uh, yeah. economics. As you mentioned, we're here to talk about the entrepreneurial state. So, a lot has changed, um, but it's still, well, as relevant as ever, really. And for anyone 
not familiar, how would you define the on, not just the entrepreneurial state, but also the myth at right. the center of the book? So first of all, the whole point of the book was to break down the myths that it's either the state or the private sector. So many of the most interesting things that we've done has required a real partnership, but it's impar impossible to partner well if you also don't have self-worth, <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't know the value of what you do, then you're probably gonna enter a very insecure relationship. So the book was not meant to glorify government, look, uh, look at everything the government did, but actually rethink, again, that underlying problematic both economic theory and economic policy that has sidelined governments. Even big governments can be sidelined. It's not about size. It's about strategic capacity. It's about investing within your capacity, but also in order to partner, to be proactive, and not to be too little, too late. I was in fixing mode. And so the book, I wrote it 10 years ago. Actually, I wrote it more than 10 years ago because I did a pamphlet version of it in 2011, a little version. Um, and then I did the full book version with new chapters on the back of the financial crisis which was caused by private debt. And somehow we ended up thinking, oh, public debt, let's just cut our way out of this crisis. I was like, uh-huh, uh, no. In fact, we didn't solve the key problem with the financial crisis. If you look at the ratio of private debt, private, not public, private debt to disposable income in the UK today, it's back to basically what it was before the financial crisis. And when that bursts, when you have all these people having mortgages, the, and not the income to pay back that mortgage, right? Something that actually for the private sector matters. Mm. It's not true that the public sector needs to earn back what you know it owes because governments can create money, they also can expand the economy, they can think about that long run kind of debt to GDP, whereas a private individual, if you go bankrupt, you go bankrupt. Yep. And so you know, these recovery schemes that make it easier to buy, uh, a, a home while your income is not growing is very problematic, and that's part of the financialization of our economy. Anyway, the reason I wrote the book was to say, let's be extremely careful the way you recover from a financial crisis. First of all, let's look at the financial sector and definancialize our economies. If you want, I can tell you what I mean by that later, or we'll get sidetracked. Let's actually also understand what we need from the public sector in terms of public investment, but also current spending. Um, in order to strengthen our social fabric, because often on the back of both the financial crisis, a COVID pandemic, the Ukraine war with cost of living and so on, people are suffering, right? So by just cutting back and then hurting the social fabric, you will ultimately not only be hurting people, but it might actually cost you more later to recover from that, right? Mm -hmm. It costs more to imprison someone than to educate them, right? So the social fabric matters. But on the innovation side, since all the kind of propaganda at the time was, oh, we have to not just recover, but we need to become competitive and innovative. And why are all the Googles happening in the US? And Europe has to you know, become competitive. And then again, all this in the midst of austerity, I was like, do you know what? You know, where Google came from? Do you know where the internet came from? Do you know where Amazon and Uber, like what they're benefiting from? Um, in terms of an, a U.S. innovation system. So the book tried to debunk the myth that Silicon Valley was created by some sort of free market miracle. Uh, you know, garage tinkerers, entrepreneurs. It showed how, uh, you know, everything that's smart in our smartphones, which we call smartphones, we don't call them dumb phones, the smart technology was all government financed. So internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri. Then we needed great companies like Apple, and if you've read the biography on Steve Jobs, you know, he invested in all this you know, interesting, also design thinking. The, the phone is really well designed. I actually know Johnny Ives, who was you know, uh, very much responsible for that, but you know, he thought about simplicity, just um, also invested in people who had really interesting backgrounds within Apple. But if he didn't have technologies like the internet, touchscreen, Siri to work with, that phone would have just been pretty, but mm. stupid, mm. pretty stupid. <laughs> Let me call you for my pretty stupid phone. Um, and so the lesson for me was, first of all, where did those technologies come from? It's not just public money. These were from purpose-oriented public institutions. The reason we have the internet is that DARPA, the Defense um, Advanced Research uh, Agency in the US Department of Defense, has often been problem-oriented and then required solutions, worked with the private sector through also their procurement program. But the reason we have the internet is they had a problem. What, what problem? They needed the satellites to communicate. The internet was the answer. With all these answers, by the way, there's lots of failure, so it's trial and error. That's why I call it the entrepreneurial state. You have to embrace risk-taking. Mm. You know, purpose orientation and risk-taking often go hand in hand. Uh, the reason we have GPS is the Navy needed to know where all the ships were, <laughs> right? That was a big problem, GPS helps. So that kind of idea that, first of all, let's understand 
that um, public investment hasn't just facilitated, hasn't just done the rules of the game to enable private sector investment, it itself invested, often as a uh, as an investor of first resort, not a lender of last resort, all that old dogma, uh, before the private sector did. You see that in biotech, nanotech, internet, clean tech, a lot of the high risk early capital investments were made by the public sector. Then later crowding in the private sector, which is naturally risk averse and has often waited for someone else to take on that early risk first. So again, debunking the word entrepreneurship, you know, entrepreneurialism, well, the risk taking is often taken from the public sector. Second that it wasn't just money, helicopter money. It came out of really capable, strategic public organizations, which many governments don't have, right? This is why it's not about glorifying government. It's telling the history of the few places that have achieved innovation-led growth. Where did that innovation come from? Yes, public money was there, but public in infrastructure, structural uh, issues mattered, mattered. Organizational competence. So an organization like DARPA, which recently in the UK we've copied, uh, we've called it ARIA, as an Italian, I call it Aria, it's area, yeah. um, you know, uh, which is actually run currently by a friend of mine, Elon Gur. Um, you know, we need to understand those organizations, just like you have business schools studying private organizations and understanding how they, uh, you know, create value, how they think out of the box, how they resist inertia. We need the same thing in the public organizations. But if you don't have a theory of value creation and wealth creation, in the public sector, you don't even ask those interesting questions that the private sector asks itself. So MBAs, Masters in Business Administration, those classes are kind of cool, right? It's like strategic management, decision sciences, organizational behavior. Whereas in the public sector, if you look at the curriculum, it's, it's kind of boring because if you're just fixing market failures, if you're just enabling value creation in the private sector, it ends up being that you have a self-fulfilling prophecy that the courses and the training for the civil ser service is just about fixing, and that's what you end up getting. Mm. So that's also why I've recently set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL, which is all about changing that curriculum around also understanding the civil service at the center of value creation. Anyway, so the book back then was about debunking those myths, telling that history of that decentralized network of public agencies across the whole innovation chain working with the private sector. It's never instead of the private sector. And then asking what are the lessons from that for the world? Instead of the lessons that the world was taking from Silicon Valley, which was, oh, we just need some good basic science. We have that in our universities. And then we need to commercialize it with venture capital. It's like, mm -hmm. that's not what happened in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I would like to talk later as well about, you mentioned sort of risk and profit, who bears the risks and who bears the profit from, yeah. from these setups. But uh, you mentioned that there's a similarity between private debt, sort of where we were when this first came out yeah. and where we are now. Yeah. The context that this book comes out in mm. 10 years later, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about any other sort of similarities mm. or differences that you see and why it's still yeah. Relevant. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's more relevant than ever because actually in the last 10 years, I'm very lucky because most academics, including myself, when you write, no one kind of listens. And then at best, you're at a conference where there's a couple policymakers and then you go back and brag, hey, there was a smart policymaker. In my case, with this book, the lessons actually were adopted. Uh, also later with Mission Economy, there's now mission instruments in the European Commission, for example. Um, a lot of the industrial strategies around the world ended up using the language of the entrepreneurial state. That word ended up getting used, this notion of investor first resort, not lender of last resort. The idea of actually studying the DARPA type organization, you know, ADIA in this country. It's, there was a, you know, it kind of changed the conversation and I'm very grateful because it, I'm not the only person who might have a good idea. It's just sometimes the time is right and that idea kind of takes off. And so, uh, with the recovery programs that we've had, for example, since COVID, the so-called recovery programs, whether it's the next-gen EU program in Europe, that's about $2 trillion, whether it's the Biden administration's uh, Inflation Reduction Act and CHIPS Act, I have been lucky to kind of, you know, it, try to influence those uh, policies from uh, the lessons of this book. For example, the Secretary of Commerce in the United States, Gina Raimondo, when she was designing the CHIPS Act, which is about $400 billion uh, to the semiconductor industry in order to become independent of Asian-produced chips, she had read the book, and we had a long conversation a year and a half ago about how to make sure, coming back to this point about socializing not only the risks but the rewards, that the act and the policy wasn't just a giveaway, 
right, to the semiconductor firms, but embodied within it, what I talk about in the book as a symbiotic, not a parasitic public-private partnership. So the conditionality, uh, people like the word reciprocity better, um, in it contains uh, clauses that the companies benefiting need to reinvest their profits back in, not use share buybacks, which have often just been used by companies that are driven by shareholder value. Uh, workers need to benefit, they need to be paid good wages. <laughs> um, uh, working conditions need to be improved and also energy efficient uh, methods throughout the whole supply chain. So energy policy is not just about energy, it's about getting every sector to reduce its carbon emissions. And so, again, that's just an example of some of the recent influence that this work has had. But it's also more relevant than ever because when the so-called state is back, right, if you look at The Economist that had a recent uh, cover, the state is back. Well, the state's always there. When it's back, is it back just, again, flooding the system with liquidity? Um, is it just back kind of, you know, building houses with concrete and cement, which creates another problem somewhere else? Or is it back in a smart way, in a strategic way? How do we make sure that people and planet really benefit from a recovery program instead of solving a problem here and creating another problem there? Mm -hmm. And so that issue about designing policies that are purpose-oriented, where that purpose is systemic, instead of just kind of you know, one little project that looks good, um, matters more than ever, precisely because there's a lot of money right now being put into the system. In the US, it's more than four trillion. Talking about purpose then, you write in the book, that there wasn't a lack of growth before the financial crisis, mm. there was a lack of direction. Yeah. So what is, should be the state's role in directing the economy and what does empowering the state to direct growth actually look like? Okay, really good question. Uh, so first of all, every uh, type of growth has a direction, it just might be a bad direction, right? So for example, in the UK, even before COVID, uh, that direction was, um, if, if, if you break down GDP, so gross domestic product, there's you know government spending, government investment, consumption, spending, business investment, and net exports. So C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Quick crash course in, in economics. Thank you. This <laughs> country was going through the C, the consumption, which doesn't mean that people had so much money, but they actually were buying a lot of things funded by credit, right? Coming back to that idea of very high uh, private debt. It wasn't an investment-led type of growth. It was a consumption-led growth fueled by private debt. So that's already a type of growth, which is a financialized form of growth. The financial sector in this country continues today to mainly finance itself, right? So it's causing a type of growth where that finance is going to finance insurance and real estate, fire. It's conveniently the acronym. <laughs> we're, we're not just on fire because of climate change, but also due to financialization. So re-steering that, for example, even without talking about climate change, just re-steering an economy towards investment-led growth requires a whole set of policies. Um, even if you get that investment-led growth, how do you make sure that investment is sustainable, that you're not just investing in, you know, filling ditches <laughs> with uh, a lot of cement, but actually a cleaner form of growth, a sustainable growth? How do you make sure that sustainable growth is also inclusive growth, reduces inequality, right? So that's where we start really talking about directions. But we shouldn't pretend everyone believes in that. Some countries or some leaders might actually want to fuel <laughs> uh, growth just in the financial sector. They might not care about climate change. They might think that inequality is just a natural outcome of survival of the fittest. So that's where leadership matters. That's, you know, coming back to the point I made before, I'm, I'm, it's an honor for me to work with uh, ambitious leaders like Mia Motley in Barbados because she has a very strong vision, as do some other leaders I work with but it can't just be about leadership. But that point that growth has not just a, a rate, but a direction means that then that directionality needs to be talked about, both the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, then what do you do about that? What does it mean for the government to talk about the direction? Does it mean that it tells everyone what, what to do? That would kill innovation, right? So top down direction setting, you know, we're gonna do sustainability, we're gonna fund this project, not that one, and you're gonna do that kind of research, and so on, that would not fuel an innovation-driven system, which I also deeply believe in. But if that innovation is causing us to go in a bad direction, that's not great innovation. So how do you, as a government, set a direction through a vision? How do you transform that vision into kind of challenges like the Sustainable Development Goals, which every country, including the UK, has signed up to? One might not agree with them, but we've signed up to them. But these are very broad challenges. How do we then locally, at the city level, at the regional level, at the national level, 
transform the sustainable development goals like gender parity, like you know, life below water so our seas and rivers are not full of sewage. <laughs> Big problem in the UK. Um, but also globally full of plastic. Yep. Uh, how do we think about um, uh, uh, carbon neutral cities and so on? but negotiate that also with different stakeholders so it's not completely top down, but there's still a vision. And how do we then use the policies that governments have, grants, loans, subsidies, bailout schemes, to empower and fuel a lot of bottom-up innovation, bottom-up investment towards that goal, leaving open the how. The interesting thing about the moon landing was that it was a very clear goal, to the moon and back, short amount of time, but the how was very open. So government used outcomes-oriented procurement, to fuel in different solutions for all the different homework problems along the way. The solutions to those homework problems got us baby formula, camera phones, software, home insulation, you know, fabric, and so on, because those were solutions to the problems that, that they required. Same thing with climate change. There's many homework problems uh, to design, say, a, a carbon neutral city. Government needs to use outcomes-oriented procurement or challenge-oriented industrial strategy, not to give one or two sectors a lot of money and hope for the best, but to get as many different sectors as possible to work together or to transform themselves towards that goal. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I mean by direction. It's a very important point because if direction is directing everyone, then that literally will kill innovation. So it's setting a direction, but leaving open the how and using government instruments both investment, but also on the demand side, you know, mm -hmm. to, to fuel and to really make that happen. Um, yeah, and I mean, what's also very much interested me, as I mentioned before, is that this can't just be about policy, it needs to be about a new mindset. And that idea of also really rethinking government and government capacity, the intra-organizational dynamics, the embracing of risk-taking experimentation. On the media side, it means don't blame government as soon as it makes a mistake, because you know what, a lot of this requires experimentation. But government itself needs to be, to know how to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested, I can tell you why the whole Tesla thing was interesting in that respect. But anyway, so it's, it's about a narrative change, a story telling change, an economic theory change, a government capacity change, a partnership change. And that kind of parasitic way in which government often works with um, the private sector, where it's just giving out kind of loans and subsidies. If things go bad, you have to go in, bail out everyone. If things go well, the success is just, you know, the profits are just taken from the private sector. That itself is something that I wrote a whole chapter on in the entrepreneurial state. And I'm increasingly interested in the different forms to socialize rewards. There are, of course, um, others who argue that it's the market that should direct where mm. we go. Um, you mentioned political leaders, so I mean, you don't have to have a particularly long political memory in Britain to remember Liz Truss. Yeah. Um, you know, that the state should not be involved in making th those directional choices, that it should be the market. And I wonder whether, well, first of all, why you think the myth that the market is best to direct that and that interventionism isn't, or state direction isn't, and also perhaps to, it might be a bit of an intellectual exercise, but in your mind, what the sort of strongest components are of someone like Liz Truss's sort of libertarian, slightly more rightward economic policies are, what do you think the strongest things about them are, even if you might disagree with them? Well, it's funny, because I don't even think she had a libertarian view. I mean, I don't want to say it was just stupidity, but it kind of was. Like, I mean, it wasn't even like a theory of the private sector. Mm -hmm. It was just really insane assumptions of what happens when you give out massive tax cuts. So she wasn't even talking about investment. Mm. Um, whether like she wasn't saying we need to reduce public investment it was literally like we're going to give this massive kind of tax cut to the private sector and what's interesting the market reacted saying then that's going to put you into massive debt right and so that was just so interesting historically that it was the market mm -hmm. that punished what you might call a neoliberal policy but I don't think we learned the right lesson on that because the point is then someone coming after that shouldn't say oh then we shouldn't invest in, you know, from the public sector and all these different things because the market will punish us. Well, the market punished you because you had an insane, not very sensible tax policy. Um, and they were right, because if you just reduce corporate tax, that doesn't mean that corporations are going to invest. It's just reduce your deficit. Mm -hmm. So it, anyway, we could talk more about that, but that would be a, um, a bit of a distraction to your exact question, which is why do we continue to have people who espouse this idea about the free market? And I would say, first of all, including yesterday when I was on a news program where I had a free marketeer near me, I said, so, so what is the free market? <laughs> 
do you know what you're talking about? No, it's invisible. You, you can't see it, Mariana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, have you read Adam Smith? And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, do you know what Adam Smith meant by the free market? Uh, <laughs> lack of state? No. <laughs> Go read Adam Smith, given that you work at the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, <laughs> hello. Um, so what Adam Smith meant by free market was free from rent. And by rent, I don't mean rent in, in homes, even though that's an example of rent. Rent meaning when you're just making money by basically doing nothing, mm -hmm. just you know, m moving around kind of existing assets or when someone is making money by just charging you like a troll under a bridge. So you're not creating value. So the classical economists, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, but also Karl, Karl Marx, had different theories of value creation and all three of them in different ways, including Adam Smith, who's always cited by the uh, neoliberal economists and politicians was mainly interested in how do we make sure the value that's being created is reinvested back into the economy. The reason he wrote The Wealth of Nations um, is that he was interested in why it's important for that value to get reinvested also into organizational change, the division of labor, his famous example of the pin factory, how if it's just one person making a pin, it's going to take them forever and they'll only make 10 pins a day. If you, if you break down that production process into the 18 I don't know how I remember this, I don't remember what I had for breakfast. Uh, 18 different functions of, of pin making, then you can increase productivity, so division of labor, productivity, growth, wealth, right? So really subtle uh, uh, analysis and very worried about if some of that value is extracted out. The physiocrats back in the 1700s had a whole model of the economy where they called landlords and, and some merchants uh, the sterile class because it would threaten the reproduction, right, this biological terminology of the system if value is extracted out. Modern day finance is extracting money out. Um, many corporate governance structures today are extracting out when you have over seven trillion, that's 12 zeros, of dollars having gone just to share buybacks, to buy back shares, to boost stock options, to boost executive pay. They would be very worried about that. Adam Smith, a free marketeer, would be worried about that kind of rent-seeking and financialization of the economy. So that's an important point I've just made, in case you don't realize it. Why? Because the free marketeers have very silly, <laughs> often, assumptions and theory that is not based on an understanding of the market. What is the market? It's not business. The market is an outcome. The type of market economy we have is an outcome of how we govern business, how we govern public institutions, how we govern their relationship. Also, by the way, third sector or trade union institutions, trade unions, we should remember, are responsible for some of the best things we have, like the weekend, Saturday, Sunday, not bad. <laughs> uh, paid leave, not bad. Children not working in factories, really good, <laughs> right? Uh, environmental regulations, <laughs> uh, many of those people fought for. Um, you know, women's rights, uh, uh, all sorts of rights that, that people didn't used to have were fought for. People died for that, right? So let's not forget the whole trade union side. But and I do think that's a, I might have to write a book about that because I think people are forgetting what labor means when we talk about the labor party. <laughs> what it should mean, work, it. work. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so just coming back to the public and private side, just to keep it a bit focus, the market is an outcome of how we govern public, how we govern private, and how we govern the relationship. And a lot of my work, including in the entrepreneurial state, has been we're, we're misgoverning both. And they're, and they're related to each other. When you have a public sector that doesn't have self-worth, that doesn't see itself as value creating, it's not surprising it gets captured. It's not surprising that then when the private sector asks it, oh, can you facilitate, can you um, you know, enable me in this way, then you just get policy that's kind of silly and doesn't lead to investment-led, innovation-driven growth. And it's not surprising that that same corporate governance structure in the business sector ends up being able to be ultra-financialized with no one asking them to, hey, hold on a second, you've got to reinvest your profits because you were facilitated mm -hmm. by public investment. Um, so so that's, that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in glorifying the public sector. I'm not interested in bashing the private sector. I'm interested in how can you work together well. And what strikes me in terms of your question is, what I'm interested in is at least those people talking about the free market and the market being able to unpick what their opinion is of those different dynamics. Mm. Not about confounding, as they often do, the private sector with the market. Because that's the biggest mistake. The private sector are companies, and they might be in the business sector, they might be in the financial sector, but what do you think, person in front of me talking about the free market, is the problem in corporate governance and how finance behaves and how they work with government and how that relationship then determines or produces market outcomes mm. that you either like or don't like, but don't confound the market with business. Okay.
Let's talk a little bit more about that relationship then. That was then. a long answer. It was great. <laughs> I loved it. Um, there was, okay, so one of my favorite lines from this, mm. and it's not a direct quote, but it's the socialization of risk and the privatization of profit. Yeah. So first of all, can you tell us what that means? Yeah. And also in a bit more detail in relation to what you were just saying there and that relationship between sort of private and public, right? Sure. First of all, that's what usually happens, that it's not true that government is only back now. Government's always there. It's often giving subsidies and guarantees, or making some investments, using demand side, supply side tools, whatever. The question is how it does it. And we talked a bit about that before, but now with this question, the question is how does it also manage how the benefits from this collective value creation, which is part of what my work's tried to do, which is to talk about values collectively created, how do you make sure it's not only created collectively, but also distributed collectively? That's not about socialism and communism, it's good capitalism, <laughs> right? Like, if, if you actually have a theory of value that is not just value created in business, but also in the public sector, how do you make sure the taxpayer and the public institutions benefit and, and, and people and planet? And so what happens usually, and I'll give you an example, is that in countries where the public sector even makes investments, let's not forget, often you don't have that. You might have countries where the public sector literally has just taken the back seat, but say the US. So the whole book is about the US. Why? To demythologize that so other countries stop learning the wrong lessons from the US. In the US, what happened after the financial crisis is they didn't do austerity like we did in Europe, which was stupid. <laughs> they actually had a proper fiscal stimulus program, 800 billion. That uh, stimulus program initially, before the Tea Party got in the way, was supposed to direct the economy towards a greener direction of growth. That's why Obama was able to bring in Nobel Prize winning physicist Steve Chu, Chinese American, to direct the Department of Energy. First thing he did was to set up an organization like DARPA that we talked about before, but in energy, called ARPA-E, brought in great guy called Arun Majumdar to direct ARPA-E. He later ran energy for Google. Anyway, all oh, this is the good part of the story, right? That's the entrepreneurial state. Wow, cool. <laughs> we're not doing austerity. We're directing the economy towards green. We're getting really ambitious uh, energy innovation agency, ARPA-E. It's all bringing in great talent. Amazing. Well, <laughs> one of those programs um, in the Department of Energy was a guaranteed loan program for companies in different areas. So not all your eggs in one basket, different areas. Um, that we're going to help kind of stimulate this entrepreneurial green ecosystem. So, surprise, surprise, Tesla comes to the table and asks for money. They get, uh, I think it was $465 million in a guaranteed loan, which now doesn't seem like a lot, right, because Tesla is, 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 you know, is earning in the billions. But in the early, early stage, when that was still very high risk, it, it did need that, right? So it comes back to that high risk, early capital intensive phase in many different sectors, first get public money, later crowd in private money. It's just a common story, but it's a good story. Another company in that portfolio of investments, notice that the language that I'm using is not necessarily the language they were using, the portfolio of public investments, almost like a public VC fund, mm. also gave money to Solyndra, a solar company that went down in history. Everyone in the US knows about Solyndra, why? A bit more money, 500 million, guaranteed loan by the Department of Energy, why is it famous? Because it went bust. So Tesla was successful, Solyndra went bust, more or less got the same amount of money. What happens? Taxpayer pays the bill for the failure, right? For the downside. Tesla, of course, does well, does pay back the loan in 2013. But what is that? Oh, it's private sector genius. Elon Musk, he's so smart, entrepreneur. Where did the money come from in the beginning? Second problem. So narrative, missing. No talk about, hey, yeah, it's normal, just talk to any VC guy or woman. For every success, you have to bear eight or nine failures, normal. Mm. You don't hear that from government. They don't have that vocabulary. So you just get a lot of people angry. Um, so what did they actually do, which was mad, it just didn't make any sense. They said to Tesla, if you don't pay back the loan, if you don't pay, they did pay, we want three million shares in your company. Now, why would you want three million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? Makes no sense. What they should have said is, okay, we got all these different investments, some are gonna win, some are gonna lose, in fact, Solyndra lost, but hey, the ones that do win, we want three million shares if you do pay back the loan if things go well. Why? So that you're not just you know, taking the downside, but also earning some money back to pay for, the, for that downside, like a public venture capitalist would. Mm -hmm. The money, in fact, the, sorry, the shares in Tesla went from nine to 90 in that period when the loan was given, 2009, 2013. Had the government taken three million shares, 
that three million multiplied by that difference, nine minus 90, would have more than paid back that cylinder loss and the next round of investment. Mm. So that's what I just call smart capitalism, right? And so you have public money trying to fuel a new direction, not putting all your eggs in one basket, but a portfolio of different companies. And you're not just gonna pick up the mess, you're also gonna get some of the good stuff to fund the next round, mm -hmm. right? So that's like, ooh, she must be a communist. <laughs> it's like, no, it's good venture capitalist. It's just why can that good venture capital only happen in the private sector? Mm. And by the way, another way to socialize rewards is not just through equity stakes. And it wasn't my idea, it was their idea. They wanted equity stakes. They just wanted it if things went bad. Makes no sense, right? Mm. So one way could be monetarily, like the example I just gave, what they should have done. But there's many different ways to do it that are also non-monetary. So for example, the conditions. Let's make sure that the companies that are benefiting from government investments reinvest their money, A, into the economy, B, into making sure that workers are benefiting instead of you know, productivity increasing but workers not getting their fair share. Um, better working conditions, green supply chains, uh, you know, these, this also socializes rewards. Why? Because those benefits that are coming out from this public investment are also being kind of directed towards doing good stuff instead of it just going back to shareholders. And lastly, if you take the example of medicines, which of course really matter, vaccines and not just medicines, but the different types of healthcare um, health uh, uh, goods and services, they're often outcomes of public investment. In the US, again, one of the stories I tell in the book, uh, every year, the government spends close to $40 billion in health innovation, not health care, health innovation. So the Pfizer drugs mm. often require first that public investment, and yet the prices of those drugs don't reflect that. The intellectual property rights are not designed to reflect that. So both designing intellectual property rights not to be too strong, so hard to license, too wide, used just for strategic reasons, and not too upstream, so the tools for research are being patented, that would be a way to govern an intellectual property rights system to reflect that public contribution. Mm. That's not done. Um, and the prices, I mean, that's just obvious. If you have invested in something, why should the taxpayer pay twice for the innovation that went into the drug and then for these very high prices or even for the welfare state that subsidizes that, mm -hmm. right? So once, twice, three different times. It's just good economics. We're, um, we're drawing to the end of our time together. Oh, so uh, no, it, it, it flies by. Um, Let's talk about the UK mm. briefly, and particularly sort of in your role, if you were to be advising the UK government, I mean, I understand you have been working with the mm -hmm. Labour Party next to the UK I, government. I've worked more with the Tories. They've been in power 13 years. Yeah. I've worked with lots of Tories. Or, you know, the next government, right? Mm -hmm. Probably a Labour government, right? Mm -hmm. um, the ideas that we've been discussing so far, that growth is a byproduct of sort of mission-led mm -hmm. economics and policy making. I'd like to ask you about, in practical terms, what do those missions look like? Mm. What missions should they be pursuing? I'd like to quote, you recently wrote uh, in an article, while important economic growth in the abstract is not a coherent goal or mission yeah. around which governments should orient their policy making, the kind of inclusive, sustainable and robust growth that they want ultimately comes as a byproduct of pursuing other socially beneficial collective ends. Keir Starmer has vowed to secure the highest sustained growth in the G7 if given power. Mm -hmm. So, given what we've discussed, why are so many politicians like Starmer running on a promise around GDP growth rather yeah. than necessarily, you know, uh, I know it's not a direct example, but yeah, for yeah. example, we're going to put a man on the moon, you know, yeah. rather than... Well, that, that was a... So uh, I'm in this funny position where often politicians and policymakers are influenced by some of my ideas, but then sort of distort, distort them. So it's very important for myself and my team to go back and say, oh, no, 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 don't just use the word. Hold on a second. The floor is yours. <laughs> Let's do a workshop. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and in fact, I'm speaking to Keir Starmer's team because I do hope they win the next election. Um, but I also, as I mentioned, spoke a lot and worked very closely with Greg Clark, a Tory who was running uh, the Department of Business and Industrial Strategy precisely to move the UK industrial strategy away from a sector-focused approach. It used to be, even under Vince Cable, automobiles, aerospace, life sciences, creative sector, and finance. Again, can't believe I remember this. Uh, and I said, why? There's all these other sectors that aren't in that little list that they just lobby their way up. Why not think of challenges that all your different sectors have to work together on? So with Greg Clark, the 2017 industrial strategy um, was based on the work we did together and the four challenges they chose there was clean growth, healthy aging, sustainable mobility, and the data economy. That was a bit of a weird one because data should go across everything. Anyway, so, so, and within that, then I set up a mission-oriented commission with David Willits, another Tory, um, currently Lord David Willits. It was called the Commission for Mission-Oriented Innovation and Industrial Strategy. We co-chaired that and we're trying to help 
Greg Clark, a Tory, rethink their industrial strategy. And that was very interesting. So the, the, the you know, fast forward now with Keir Starmer, who uses the concept of missions, I think, in an interesting way. I'm trying to help him uh, uh, develop it, um, him and his team, um, in a more interesting way, which is that missions aren't just a word. You don't have a growth mission or an NHS mission. You need a strong NHS, but to do what? Mm. You need growth, but how are we going to get there? And the lessons from the entrepreneurial state was that the reason we got growth out of the moon shot was not because anyone said, oh, we need to create economic value from the space race. They didn't ever worry about that. The reason we got growth and got commercialization and got technological change, camera phones, foil blankets, software, see the Hidden Figures movie, mm -hmm. no? it, was, it was a great movie which showed how software itself uh, came out of um, the space race, um, was because of all those problems that had to be solved that required public and private investment collaboration, well-designed contracts, and outcome of that was this amazing uh, technological and organizational change which fueled growth. If people just say, we need growth, we need productivity increase, oh, we're gonna spend a lot of money in R&D. Really? Okay, who doesn't want that? Who, like, tell me one country that doesn't wanna grow, one country that doesn't want more jobs, one country that doesn't want more productivity. And yet what we mainly have, even in the uh, Western world, is lagging productivity lagging or problematic growth, uh, problematic uh, situation in terms of work, in terms of workers not benefiting from the type of growth we have. So that's not enough to talk about growth. The question is, what do we know that actually causes growth, mm -hmm. right? And that's where, and then I would have to repeat everything I've just said, that I think that having, again, purpose-oriented public institutions led by a vision, let's just take the climate vision, which then requires every sector to change, the steel sector, needs to change, right? It needs to lower its material content of production throughout its whole supply chain if it will be part of a green transition. We don't just get rid of steel, we maybe support steel, which is in trouble, if it changes. That's what happened in Germany. The reason we have green steel in Germany and in Sweden is that the public bank in Germany, called the KfW, put that as a condition on the loan program. Here we just do giveaways. Again, you know, 600 million to EasyJet during a COVID <laughs> uh, bailout to do nothing. Whereas in France, they put conditions for Renault and Air France, the support was conditional on those companies committing to lowering their carbon emissions. That's part of a sustainability transition plan. So what I think the Labor Party needs to do is learn lessons from that, have missions around health, around digital, you know, reducing the digital divide to zero. Mm. So then the next lockdown, there will be more lockdowns. If you look at what's happening with climate, <laughs> as the permafrost melts, <laughs> which it is, new viruses will be coming out. That's what the science says. Mm. We might have another lockdown, hopefully not. If we do, let's make sure that this time around, every kid continues to access their human right to education, which mm. did not happen during the last lockdown globally, right? So you can make or take school meals, which unfortunately we're hearing that even labor is not gonna commit to. Um, I'm an Arsenal supporter, but I did clap the other day when Marcus Rashford scored. Did My you? kids almost killed me, why? Because I love the guy. He is a hero. He fought for, it's so important what he did. He fought for free school meals. It, mm -hmm. it, it gives me shivers. You don't get football players you know, doing really ambitious public policy. But what I'm interested in is how do you make something like that, which is a welfare policy, into an innovation policy? How do you do what Sweden did, which is that school meals not only are important from a kind of human rights point of view, because uh, that's often the only good meal that many kids get, but that it's gonna be part of your innovation policy. The school meals will be healthy, tasty, not just Ikea meatballs, and sustainable sustainable, so sustainability in a green transition, even in something as simple as a school meal, something as important as a school meal, right? That could transform the supply chain, it requires innovation, it can change agribusiness, it can change how you think about nutrition, and you can even get kids to participate in the design. We haven't talked about that, but that's some of the work I do at the local level, participation, so citizen participation, but as we're almost done, I won't go into that. But that's what the Labor Party, I think, should be thinking about missions, missions on food that then trickle down into something like school meals, mm -hmm. that then require innovation and investment, because that then increases your GDP. Because innovation and investment are drivers of long-term <laughs> GDP growth because of the productivity enhancing. So even though it might look like it's increasing your deficit in the short term, mm. if you do it in such a way that expands productive capacity and a green productive capacity, the denominator of debt to GDP is growing, keeping the ratio in check. 
But that's the smart economics that we should be having to show you're fiscally responsible. It's not the dumb economics by saying, oh yeah, we're gonna do green, but not too much money. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll help people. Oh, but we can't afford school meals. It's like, what have you learned? <laughs> anyway. Um, Mariana, every time, well the last two times we've done this, we've sort of flirted with talking about financialization and run oh. out of time. Maybe next time, uh, maybe well, we Well, I can tell you one statistic. That. 80% of UK finance goes to finance, insurance, and real estate, what we talked about before. That's financialization of the financial sector. Financialization of the private sector is that over seven trillion dollars have been used on share buybacks. That's all you need to know. There we are then, so we won't, we won't bother. Um, Mariana, thank you so much for thank coming you. in. Thank you. I really appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks. Thank you.